and to the general public. This seminar series is entitled Fire Ecology and Management in the Blue Mountains, which explores the role and function of fire in the ecosystem. The fourth of the five sessions looks at two subjects, can silviculture replace the role of fire and effects of fire on wildlife. I hope you find it interesting. Our second speaker is Russ Graham, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what Russ has to offer tonight on alternatives to fire. Let's welcome Russ Graham. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here this evening. I, uh, and one of those disclaimers, anytime I always speak to a group, you always have these amount of disclaimers. And uh, the best disclaimer I have in the room tonight is two people that I worked with here about 10 years ago. And one's a silviculturist and one is a fisheries biologist. So any questions that I can answer in those two subjects, I'll direct it. Uh, a couple people in this room that I know quite well. So it's uh, a fun time to talk silviculture. And uh, when we talk, start talking about the, uh, can silviculture replace the, the role of fire? And I think the things that we need to start really looking at is what is silviculture first? We heard that term batted around here when John was speaking about what is silviculture. And what does silviculture and what does forest management have in common and how do those two work together? And I think we'll explore, I'll explore that a little bit before we get into what fire does and what silviculture can do. And I think the first thing to maybe just start out the definition. And the theory is the theory and practice of controlling forest growth. And I think there's a very operative word in there is forest. Not stand, not tree, it's forest growth. And the other operative words in there is to meet management objectives. The practice of silviculture, of course, originated in the early 1900s in the United States. And it came across from Europe, from England, from Germany. And it was pretty much those practices were laid out by the German foresters and English foresters. And even an Indian forester who practiced in India for many years laid out a lot of our early silvicultural practices. And we worked to some management direction. Remember, as the Forest Service, we as a society, through our elected officials, through our planning process, we have management direction. And this management direction then, the earliest one I can find a good reference for, was the 1926 Forest Service Manual. And you notice there that it says that inferior species will not be pushed on the market. And in other words, we won't go out and even manage inferior species. We won't push them onto the market. In fact, we'll even cut down and kill some of these inferior species. And you think, well, okay, this happened in 1926. What's that got to do with 1993? We were still doing it in 1961 on the Bitterroot National Forest. Remember Lodgepole, Douglas fir, uh, Grand fir, is not now and never will be a commercial species. And that was in a 1934 uh, management plan for one of our national forests in western Montana. Basically, that's what it said. So we went out and we killed these stands. Here's a, a stand of grand fir. We went out and we discriminated against them in our management. Now here in the Blue Mountains, Western Oregon, um, Western, uh, excuse me, Eastern Oregon and, and Eastern Washington, how many times did we manage grand fir in the 1920s and 1930s? How often did we feature it in any of our management to look at its silvical characteristics? What species did we harvest then in the Blue Mountains predominantly? in the Bitterroot Valley, in the Coeur d'Alene Valley. It was Ponderosa Pine. That was the only species that we had out there to manage. And the way we managed it so many times is we went out and cut it down and took it to the mill. So when you look at that, let's look at, uh, let's go back to about what? The, I think on that slide I have 1869 is some of the first data that I'm able to find. And you notice there that this is just north Idaho. This is north of the Clearwater River in Idaho a very small area. This is in millions of board feet cut annually. This is the annual cut of uh, uh, ponderosa pine and white pine in the early 1900s. You notice there that in, um, in what is that, 18, uh, in the 1890s, we were cutting nearly all ponderosa pine. And that was out of the valley bottoms along the Coeur d'Alene, uh, some along the St. Joe, Joe, 
some along the Clearwater Rivers, around Moscow, Idaho, and the Plouffe. We cut a lot of ponderosa pine. Then by 1910, you notice, the uh, white pine started coming on real strong. And then by the 1925, more white pine was being cut. And by 1935, the amount of ponderosa pine being cut went down. Now, it's sort of a sidelight. You see that nice big white pine tree there? That's on the Clearwater National Forest. Do you know what that went to, the, to produce in 1910, 1920, 1930? Do you know what we cut those trees down to make? Toothpicks and matches. That's what we cut those down and took them to the mill. On where Sue Rainville there in the middle of the room used to work, we had a road called the Diamond Match Road. It was built by matches being hauled out of the Coeur d'Alene National Forest in match blocks about 24 inches long. Remember, that was 351 million board feet a year we were cutting in 1935 through 1938 of western white pine. Remember, there's up to 10 species growing in those forests in the northern Rocky Mountains. Ponderosa pine, larch, Douglas fir, and look at that highly important component of, Doug, of grand fir, how much we were harvesting. How about spruce, lodgepole, subalpine fir didn't even hit the register. But remember, all of these species were being left out there. So now, we looked at this problem, and we say, uh, some people said, well, we're over harvesting these trees, we're leaving a lot of disease susceptible, and John mentioned it, the tussock moth, the spruce budworm, the armillaria root rots, the felinus root rots, all of those could attack the grand fir, the Douglas fir, uh, the, the pine beetles attack, the lodgepole pine. And some people did recognize that we were overcutting some of the pines. And for example, in 1942, uh, Hutchison and uh, Winters here recognized that if, they can, if we continued, we as a society continued to cut 351 million board feet per year in just north of the Clearwater River by 19, what is that, 1959, we would have it all gone. Well, you know, as a society, we did a very good job of it. We got rid of a lot of that white pine. Okay, that is the conditions that we as society put into the northern Idaho, the eastern parts of Oregon and Washington. We did that to our forests. We cut out a lot of the cereal species, we cut out the ponderosa pine, we cut out the white pine, we cut out the larch. Now fire prior to the 1900s well, operated pretty freely until about 1910 and the late 1800s. Fire pretty much oper operated freely throughout the northern Rocky Mountains. And so what did fire, how did fire create some of these ecosystems and what did it look like? Well, natural fire, in contrast to silviculture, does not uh, do anything according to management objectives. It's a little more opportunistic and a little more unpredictable. We can predict fires, and uh, as a sidebar there, Gisborne started his research, research in northern Idaho in about 1930. He was one of the premier fire researchers. And the way he first predicted fire danger, would you believe, he stood up on a mountain and held up a gray piece of glass. And the way he would predict fire danger, if that gray piece of glass matched the sky, the fire danger was a little higher. If the darker gray got a little higher, or excuse me, the, he held up a darker gray glass, and it was a little darker, and the sky was there, the fire danger was higher, because there was more smoke in the air, so the fire danger was higher. That was the first dire fire danger rating systems we had in the northern Rocky Mountains. So like I say, Fire is, you know, we can predict it a little bit, but sometimes our methods are a little on the skeptical side. Okay, fire can remove high forest cover, and John mentioned that and showed that we can, we have stand replacing fires. Fire will thin understory vegetation, and we had some discussion with John about how, how could we protect some of those trees if we were running an under, uh, underburn through them. It'll prepare a site for regeneration. The two number one seed beds for conifer regeneration in the northern Rocky Mountains is bare mineral soil and burned over surfaces. Those are the two number one seed beds for regeneration of conifers. Stimulates the growth of understory. How about buckbrush, ceanothus for elk or deer? Uh, ceanothus likes fire, you scarify the seeds with heat and you get a tremendous flush of ceanothus on some of our sites. Cycles nutrients. Fire is a very good at cycling nutrients. If, we, if the fire does not burn extremely hot, 
volatilize every piece of nitrogen on the side up into the air, S nitrogen can be cycled very effectively, and it, as it does carbon. Maintain site adaptive species. We saw those slides earlier that if Douglas fir or grand fir is growing on a ponderosa pine site, a fire comes through that, it can kill the grand fir as thin barked, less tolerant of the fire, and it can maintain species. And also the genetically adapted species are very good at fire uh, relationships. It can operate at the stand level, and as John pointed out, it can operate at the landscape. 256,000 acres of the Boise burned up. In 1910, a lot of northern Idaho burned up, a lot of western Montana burned up. So then, we have those activities now of forests, were created by fire up to about 1950, 1930s. Also, then we had humans. We kept picking and plucking, taking a lot of volume off of the tree, uh, out of the forests. But at the same time then, we decided in the mid-1950s that high-yield forestry was going to be some of our answers. And we went back to the basics and said, here are some of the people that produced information to do, conduct that high-yield forestry. People like Haig and Davis and Pearson, Schubert, Wellner are some of those people that produced information on forest dynamics, forest growth, regeneration, stand dynamics. All of these people produced information on how to produce timber products. We can manage trees from an individual tree level and look at it, tree classifications all the way up to stand dynamics. We're very good as silviculturists. We have a lot of information to manage at those levels. We have just started approaching managing at the landscape level. And in northern Idaho, we as silviculturists and forest managers could do a very good job. We could clear cut, broadcast burn. We could optimize rotation ages. We can maximize mean annual increments. And in 30 years, 40 years, we could produce stands of white pine like this. But times are changing. Maybe not like they are in Moscow, Russia this morning and yesterday, but times are changing in the Forest Service. And some of us, if we can handle that pressure, that a couple of regional foresters I've talked to recently said, if you can stand the internal indigestion that the changes are going in and around us, it's the most fun there is to be in the Forest Service right now, is the changes that we're going through. But the things that we did in the past are not necessarily bad. Remember, those are management objectives that we were trying to achieve. And Winnie Kessler, I think, put it together real good here that foresters have served society well in this regard. And using sciences and improved practices to make the land produce more efficiently and economically. We as silviculturists have done a very good job. But like I say, times are changing. Goshawks, grizzly bears are all becoming important parts and important components of our forests. For example, what does white pine blister rust that we introduced in Victoria, British Columbia, and also into some place in Maine in the early 1900s have to do with the survival of the grizzly bear? What do those two have in common? The white pine blister rust and the grizzly bear. Well, it happens to be that the grizzly bear gets a tremendous amount of its food from white bark pine nuts. And guess what disease is now devastating the white bark pine of the northern Rocky Mountains? It's blister rust. So those innocuous little things, and then we could throw in the nutcracker, we could throw in fire, all work together. Everything is connected. Another example I have here is with this goshawk. What does mycorrhiza, the little ectomycorrhiza fungi, have to do with the goshawk? Organic matter supplies mycorrhizal habitat. Mycorrhiza, in turn, fruiting bodies supply food for the squirrels. And the squirrels, in turn, supply food for the goshawk. So when we start looking at times are changing, we're starting to look at how things are connected. No longer can we just look at trees. So how does silviculture start approaching these new, quote, paradigms or these new ideas? We know a lot about managing forests for producing timber crops. We know that... Uh, we can take and treat forests to management objectives. We are predictable within limits. We can predict quite readily how fast trees grow, what kind of regeneration we're going to get, 
what kind of successional stages we're going to move through. We can remove high forest cover if that's desired. We can thin trees mechanically. We can thin trees with fire. We can thin trees by girdling. We can manage, manipulate vegetation in all uh, methods and means. We can prepare sites for uh, tree regeneration. We can stimulate the growth of understory. We can scarify sites. We have different uh, understory vegetation that we can easily bring on very, uh, with our management activities. We can maintain site adaptive species. The classic example there is white pine blister rust. What we know about the genetics of white pine is once more making it a, vi a viable species in the northern Rocky Mountains. Also that we know how to manage the genetics of Douglas fir, lodgepole pine, some of those species. We can operate at the stand level and we can operate at the landscape level. But one thing fire does that we as silviculturists and managers have not really figured out is to really how to manage those nutrients and that nutrient cycling real well. We can open up stands to increase decomposition. Decomposition is another form of combustion. Just like fire, decomposition is combustion. Uh, we have a, a, pi um, a pathology project in Moscow and one of our uh, discussions around coffee and a beer is how about a super fungus? Let's introduce a super fungus or manage for fungus to decompose this material and then we wouldn't have to worry so much about a fire. And we could do that by moisture and aeration and handle those and manage those two elements that we might actually increase decomposition in some of our forests. But the one that we, I do not think that I know a way that we could manage would be the changes in pH. You have some uh, forests here on the Blue Mountains that Dennis Ferguson calls a mosaic of grand fir. This is a high elevation grand fir site that is understory of cone flower and bracken fern. These high elevation sites are prone to a uh, acid soils. The only way to increase that pH then is through some type of burning mechanism as we can understand right now. And this long-term increase in pH is a very important factor in some of our forests. But maybe not in all of them. Maybe acid rain deposition or something might make it important. But this is one thing that we probably cannot modify mechanically or with other means. But then again, we have done one other thing in our forests. We have managed these forests since 1910. We've excluded fire. This is a very common occurrence in a lot of the Rocky Mountains when we look at these fuel loadings, 100, 200 tons per acre of downed material. And we saw some pictures of the Boise earlier this evening. Fire protection is management. It's a conscious decision. Someone asked John about what are we going to do with wilderness areas? I think they should be factored in the equation. We have tremendous volumes of biomass out there in wilderness areas. And we keep putting smoke jumpers in them year after year to put out the fire. One inch of ponderosa pine litter equals 10 to 14 tons per acre of biomass. In three years, a ponderosa pine stand can produce 10 tons of biomass laying on the ground in litter. <coughs> Dense multi-storied stands, and John showed us many pictures of that. The species conversion, we've already talked about this this evening. And then meadows turning into forests instead of open meadows. How do we manage and manipulate that vegetation then? Someone asked, well, I think on one of the remote sites says, who's going to pay for it? Well, let's see, the Foothills fire are 256,000 acres. How much money did we spend to put that fire out? How much money do we spend every year to put fires out? How much money do we spend to try to ameliorate conditions that we've created? Maybe there's some kind of a helicopter method that we could develop. There's an engineer over in Seattle that used to doodle on the back of napkins and have all different kinds of methods to move vegetation out of forests. So, can silviculture start replacing fire? I think that silviculturists can operate to any kind of management objecti objectives we're giving for sustainability and functions of forests. We cannot totally replace the role of fire, but we can come very close to it by all types of mechanical means. Species selection, thinning, biomass removal, etc. The one that we might have to very 
consider so much, and that's what John brought up, is protect that soil resource. Fire didn't run around with a D6 trying to scalp or scarify sites. And somehow we need a method to bunch up material, haul it out by a skyline, or like they do in Europe. This skyline I watched over in Europe in, uh, I believe this is Switzerland. In the morning they brought down milk cans. In the afternoon they brought down logs off of the same uh, standing skyline. So there is ways that I think that we can manage this vegetation. But this is not the way to do it. I wish this was one of our cuts that I could show you from 1930s. But this is one of our answers for wildlife scenic values in northern Idaho. And I think I, this picture, I'm dating it, but it's only about eight to 10 years old. This was our answer. Instead of clear cutting, we left a bunch of this out here. And we called this forestry. We did some of that in the Blue Mountains, I guarantee you also. So the alternatives. I think proactive, we need to, to start addressing some of these issues, and we have. It's expensive. The value of the products won't pay for it. Maybe the goshawk, maybe wildlife money is going to have to start footing some of the bill instead of always timber management. Maybe fisheries. Forest product values are increasing. Uh, one of my acquaintances at the University of Idaho says that if the value of, um, or the cost of material keeps going up, that we will be able to artificially produce a two by four like we do I-beam two by tens. And the two by four is not too far away out of just chip material. No management except uh, fire protection is, is management. And we got property value in lives. And as a society, are we willing to risk that? Because these fires do burn. Maybe as a, as a fatalist, you say, well, in my watch, it's not going to. But it might. So instead of attempting to totally replace fire, let's write a good silviculture prescription and remember, a silviculture prescription is defining a silvicultural system as a planned set of activities through the entire life of a, quote, forest. And by using innovative techniques, I think that we can accomplish a lot of this. But you know what? Maybe these problems, and to, as a summary of what we're looking at, is uh, not maybe that difficult to grasp. The picture that has been drawn thus far can be hardly called satisfactory. We saw pictures of the, uh, the Boise. We spent a tremendous amount of money here on the east side of Oregon and Washington addressing forest health problems, overcutting the pines and undercutting of other species. I think that's, that's very obvious to a lot of us. There's an unbalanced drain on a lot of our forests. Then this last one, the confusion is added by the fact that the public, local, state, federal governments have not come to an agreement on the problem the approach and the division of responsibility. It's the game and fish's fault for managing elk and not my fault for providing hiding cover. But there's really no shortage of solutions. We know what they are. The problem is to select one that's going to upset the apple cart the least and to transform it into an action program. And to recognize that the course which best from a pure local standpoint does not uh, serve the best in the national interests. These last two slides I wish that I could take credit for them. I wish I could take credit for this verbiage. But there's the answer. Those, those words came out in December of 1942 by Hutchison and Winters to recognize the problem. We're 50 years later and we're talking about the same problem. It hasn't changed. We still are batting around the same problem that we did 50 years ago. So therefore, civil culture is the art and science of managing force to meet a management objective. So when you shave in the morning, comb your hair, what have you in the mirror, ask yourself as a member of society, do you want to change or not? Also, I think you have to address what are we going to do is keep importing our wood from British Columbia, Brazil, or Siberia. Or are we going to find some way to manage our forest for sustainability and function and still produce some timber crops?
Any questions? Thank you. Go ahead, push the button, Jim. <laughs> I guess I'm just a little concerned about the, uh, and I know you haven't said this, you haven't said that silviculture can replace fire, and you listed a number of things that fires do ecologically. Do you ever worry that you, you haven't or won't ever be able to identify all of the things that fire does ecologically? Well, I think John introduced the topic as best as that we could on a landscape level. And he pointed out his pie chart of the Boise National Forest. If he only attempted this on one quarter of the Boise Forest, there are so many other of that mosaic out there. So to be more exacting is that if we started today to do everything on every acre of the National Forest in the West, your lifetime and my lifetime and our kids' and our grandkids' lifetimes would expire before we made the entire circle. So I don't think that that's a really a problem, that there's going to be enough wildfires and other fires operating within our systems to maintain that functionality. Uh, but at the same time, I think that if we protect that soil, we protect that organic matter, that I think that we can sustain these forests. That's the, the bottom line, in my own opinion, that we, it, it can be accomplished. Is there any um, discussion when you're talking forest plans, and you said there currently isn't any plan in terms of the wilderness areas, um, is there any move to include wilderness areas in the management so we don't have another Yellowstone, um, basically so that they can do like small prescribed burns to reduce fuel loads selectively? As a researcher, I opened my mouth one time in a meeting and I said, I would like to see the next forest plan and I have a district ranger here in the room that he would just sign his name and say, I will sustain my district and a forest plan and a district plan. And that would be the ideal. But we as humans and society don't trust that district ranger and that forest supervisor to do it. So by gosh, we want to make sure that we tell him and prescribe what we can do. And we want to reserve those wilderness areas or what have you. I would like to see him be included in some ecosystem package. The bitterroot is my best example. I would like to see ecosystem analysis go from the top of the bitterroots to the bitterroot river. And that includes all the way from wilderness areas through forest ground all the way to private land. Would be the ideal way to do it. But in reality of where we're going to reach that until we burn down a few more Yellowstones, I doubt it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that Push the button. Uh, yeah. You got to hold it down. You mentioned that Hutchinson had some of the answers or identified the problems in 1942. I'm just wondering from your experience in research if you feel that management is using research results to its maximum. Is uh, research, is management using research to their maximum? I guess the best way is I can answer that is my career as a researcher right now in the last four years of my life, and I just told some of my acquaintances here in the room, I've only spent five full weeks in Moscow in the last four years. And I have spent a tremendous amount of time with management. And if anything, I see that they, the managers that I deal with are so hungry and so willing to work with us that I have to make sure I don't compromise my own values and say, this is the facts, you know and stay to the facts, that I don't get involved into some kind of management decision. So yes, I would say that they're using it and even demanding more of our time all the time, uh, as best as they can. Go to Wallowa Valley. Questions? Uh, what is your confidence, uh, what is your confidence in the ability to control logging and what is your confidence in the ability to control fire? Tell you, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth, maybe a facetious answer to that. I have more confidence sometimes in controlling fire than I do the logging. <laughs> uh, but that's, that is probably a facetious uh, answer to your question. Um, I think one of the 
one of the positive things that I see coming online in the Forest Service is what's something they call stewardship contracts. And that very possibly could be that we put the onus on the logger from not only cutting the trees down, but also for a long-term commitment to the forest. And I think that that has some validity that we might be able to control the logger. But until we get better, better methods of contracting or selling trees and administering contracts, it's always going to be a problem. It's just like uh, when you wake up in the morning and understand that the nuclear power plant in your backyard was built by the lowest bidder. <laughs> uh, and that's the same way with logging. So often the person that we are assigned to be the custodial of our processes is sometime the lowest bidder in many contexts. So I think that we have a lot of work that we could do there. But at the same time there's very good logging and extremely good logging. In the same way there's extremely good management of fire. In the northern Rocky Mountains, we have some people that are able to underburn very thin bark species, the grand fir, the white pine, the hemlock, and be able to maintain that nutrient base, to maintain the organic matter. And then other places, uh, the, the application of fire is, less, um, is much less as a science, and we have direct, uh, very poor results. So in any of the tools I mentioned, sometimes we have very good results, and sometimes we can have very <coughs> poor results. All right. Any more questions from Molawa? Yeah, I would uh, like to comment there that the pine left the fur back in 1940. And I would like to suggest that that was due to the fact there was no market for the fur. And uh, since then, in the last 50 years, I've seen not only the pine hydrated, but also the fur cut the best and leave the rest. And the almighty dollar dictated the management out there. We left all the trash, mistletoe, forked, crooked trees, and the genetically inferior ones to reproduce. And I think that's probably our biggest problem today. Well, you just stated it in a little more uh, terse terms than I did. <laughs> <laughs> Are there questions? No more questions. Okay, thank you. We'll go to Western uh, Western Oregon College then in Monmouth. Questions. No questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, we've made the rounds to the remote sites. Do we have any more questions from LaGrande? Well, I'm a little confused. Last week, Art Tiedemann spoke, and he talked about nutrient cycling, and he said fire was actually detrimental to several of the nutrients that you mentioned tonight as being beneficial, um, for instance, nitrogen. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more? Well, I know Art's work, and I've read it, and I agree with him to the point that it depends on the fire. Nitrogen volatilizes at 400 degrees C. And if you take and burn a fire through a, a forest, and you have that a high intensity fire, and let's, let's go to the southwest or to a ponderosa pine stand where we have, remember how many, how many tons I said in an inch equals? That's 10 tons per inch. We have duff depths in the southwestern United States approaching a foot deep around the base of big trees. We light that on fire, what temperature do you think that underlying ground is going to reach? Extremely high temperatures and the nitrogen disappears and flushes down the stream or goes up and volatilizes. If you would burn that when the duff moistures are very high and you had uh, plenty of soil moisture, you can actually get condensation down in those layers. So like I said earlier, every tool that we use, fire can be good or bad, so can a tractor out there can be good or bad. Uh, remember, nitrogen is the main one that we can flush off the system. Uh, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, some of those are volatilized at much lower temperatures. So the key to not uh, totally uh, not using fire is to use it properly, I guess is my answer to that. And in a previous talk, someone asked, well, we'll burn up all the coarse woody debris. If you burn that coarse woody debris and run your fire through, at very high moisture contents, it doesn't burn. It'll stay there. Other questions? 
If none, let, let's uh, thank Russ for his presentation and for coming. I'm going to talk about forest health and wildlife, and it's a big, it's a priority in our forest, uh, this forest health uh, concerns, and I think I'll go over some of the things that we've been experiencing for the last seven years, and what I think the ramifications are to wildlife on the Boise. And first let me start by, uh, oh, I just showing it this. Uh, the Boise National Forest is uh, one of the more southern forests on the, um, in Idaho. It's one of the more drier forests, and um, as a result, it's uh, particularly vulnerable to drought-type con conditions, which are cyclic for our area. And uh, it's um, 2.5 million acres, and 1.9 of that is uh, forested acres, and about 90% of that, or a little bit less, is um, a dug fir habitat type, or dug fir ponderosa um, uh, species are found. In the last six years, the Boise has been plagued by a number of pests affecting um, uh, all of Idaho forests, but particularly hard on the Boise. And those include the uh, Douglas fir bark beetle and, and uh, tussock moth, spruce beetle. And as this, this map shows, uh, the pink there shows the areas where we've particularly hard hit by the Doug fir uh, beetle. And as you can see on the Boise National Forest, it's been particularly hard hit. And that's another indication of that we're a dry forest uh, compared to some of the more northern forests. This shows a uh, relationship of the number of trees killed and basically shows the uh, results of the drought we've gone through and the um, epidemics and, uh, from beetle. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly because I want to let the, set the uh, background as to what has happened in the forest. This shows a tussock moth epidemic that's now over on the Boise. It was a three-year event. And again, you can see that when looking at the uh, Intermountain region in Idaho, uh, the Boise was particularly hard hit as compared to the surrounding forests. This shows the de defoliation acres of the uh, spruce budworm on the Boise. And uh, the trees killed by bark beetle in relation to average precipitation. And again, you can see that the primary peaks associated with tree mortality related to uh, the decline in precipitation over the last few years of drought. And this shows the trees killed by insects uh, in the Intermountain region, which is uh, composed of southern Idaho, Utah, Nevada, and portions of Wyoming. And you can see, again see that the Boise has uh, been particularly hard hit. Uh, again, trees killed by bark beetle. And I'm going to go through these real quick because I think you get the picture that we've had a lot of epidemic and, and problems. Um, but we're talking about fire here, and one of the things I wanted to bring up is looking at the, the uh, pattern of fire disturbance on the Boise. And over the last several decades, we've had an average uh, fire disturbance of approximately 2,000 acres up until 1986, in which our fire disturbance increased to approximately 56,000 acres per year. And that's a substantial increase in, uh, in effects on our forest. And it represents a uh, significant change in what we anticipated to occur when we started looking at, um, the, again, the precip in relation to fires. You can see that as the precip went down, our, it's logical to assume that our fires went up. And it also represents a departure from our forest plan, which assumed that we would have uh, approximately 10,500 acres a year. And uh, the part of the uh, figure on the left shows what we've, how we've departed from it, basically, in salvaging timber from these fires. But what I want to talk about is a little bit about what we think is going on in terms of stand dynamics 
because we don't think what we're experiencing the last few years in terms of the epidemics in uh, fire, the increase in fire size of stand replacement fire, and the uh, epidemics of insect and disease is, is something that's natural for our forest. It was certainly uh, brought about and aggravated by the droughts, but we think that there's some other things that have occurred on our forest over the last hundred years that have brought this about. This particular um, slide shows uh, fire scars that Bob Steele had uh, tracked through in the Boise Basin of our forest. And basically what he's found is that prior to settlement, uh, European settlement into the, uh, on the Boise National Forest, within the Doug Fir, Nine Bark, Doug Fir, uh, Spirea habitat types, we had uh, fires that ranged in frequency from one every nine, ten years to every, every tw 30 years in the wet sites with an average of around 15 to 20 years. And those fires created totally different kind of stand conditions that we have than we have right now. They left stands that were predominantly uh, mature and uh, old trees that were sparsely, uh, we think, sparsely, uh, a sparse density, and uh, approximately somewhere around 12 to 15 trees per acre, and a very large old ponderosa trees with a light understory. And this kind of shows a a light burn that would go through and the resistant uh, bark that Ponderosa had would, would be able to sustain itself in these kind of fires. We think there was three reasons why, uh, well basically there was, there was a number of reasons why we had these number of fire frequencies and one was Native Americans influence on the, on the area and lightning strikes and lack of fire suppression. But since uh, settlement what we've seen is a dramatic change in our stand conditions and I think this slide shows uh, some of the conditions that are really prevalent on our forest, and that's basically the remnant stand of Ponderosa dominated by an immature stand of Doug fir. And obviously I picked a slide that, that shows our point. Not all stands are like this, but all of them have these kind of characteristics, and basically that it's um, a change in the understory composition, an increase in tree density, and laddering fuels that, that take fire up into the crown. And those changes have had a number of effects. And one of the effects is co increased competition for available water. And so in periods of drought, we think we're seeing a, a totally different response in terms of the influence of disease and, and insects. This happens to be tussock moth um, infestation here. The other effect we've see, we feel we've, we're seeing on our forest is an increase in what we call stand replacement fire. Those are the crown fires that that uh, eliminate um, all the trees, basically. And I'm not here to talk about whether fire is good or bad, but basically what we think is the changes in the kind and the pattern of fires and uh, what that means in terms of wildlife. Because um, as we've gone from that light understory burn, uh, which maintained an open stand with patches of old growth where there was uh, traditional old growth climax forest where there was uh, fuel breaks, We've now gone to stands of um, mature or, or uh, remnant stands of ponderosa dominated by Doug fir. And we'd like to think about that in terms of what we call the uh, natural, range, natural historic range of variability. And this slide shows kind of a concept we have for one of our areas in our forest, the Logging Gulch area. And it's a comparison of past, present, and future successional stage diversity across uh, uh, from a landscape pr a perspective. And the long, long line shows the natural historic range of variability which we estimate occurred in the landscape. The uh, star, or excuse me, the little circle dot there uh, gives an idea of where we think we are now in relation to uh, in, you know, what that successional stage represents in the landscape. And the star there, the asterisk, represents where we think we're going to go in the future on some of these stands. And as you can see, one of the most dramatic changes is the old growth ponderosa pine cereal stage, which once represented somewhere around 25 to 35, 40 percent of the landscape, and now is almost non-existent. That was that stand that had the frequent understory fires, open conditions, light, under, light fuel loading in the understory, and um, fairly low density tree densities. The also, the other one that appears outside the natural 
range or natural pattern of disturbance is the immature stands, and those again are those, the acres haven't changed, they're the, they're the same place, but they're the remnant stand of ponderosa pine, which is now uh, dominated by immature dug fir. And when we're, what we're trying to do is look at the characteristics and the changes that we're seeing in the forest in three levels. And one is, um, well, I have here the project watershed and landscape. You can look at the project as a stand uh, level analysis, looking at the composition of each one of these stands and how that's changed over time. And obviously, with the change, if, if you believe the assumption that we had frequent understory fires and now have changed that to very infrequent, uh, high intensity canopy fires, then the change in stand structures, we've gone from a low tree density, fairly uh, uniform stand to one that has um, a lot more trees, a lot more uh, canopy layers, a lot more snags, a lot more understory fuels, but is also highly vulnerable to uh, greater intensity fires. And uh, what this has implications to wildlife. And I apologize for these slides. They didn't come across. Uh, as well as I wanted, and so I'll try to um, draw on here and show what, I'm, what my intent was. But basically, on the, coming to the wildlife section, on the Boise National Forest, we're, looking, we're required to l maintain viable populations for all desired uh, native and non-native species, and that's part of the National Forest Management Act requirement. And, a and the National Forest Management Act defines viable populations as um, having the distribution of reproductive pairs across the planting area. And so ability to maintain that distribution and uh, interconnections between suitable habitats is one of the essential portions of uh, viability analysis. And we look at three different components of viability analysis. One is the demographics or the population characteristics, how well they are able to reproduce. The other one is the distribution, patch size uh, of suitable habitat. And the third one is, um, it's influenced, how it's influenced by environmental factors such as insects, disease, and, and fire. And today I, today I want to talk primarily about the changes in fire from what we think existed pre-settlement to current and what that means in terms of the ability to maintain viable populations of such species as pileated woodpecker, uh, flammulated owls, uh, white-headed woodpeckers, and whatnot. And the example I use is pileated woodpeckers because um, it's a species, I think, that's increased its range considerably on our forest since uh, settlement and is, influ is affected severely by stand replacement fires. And this, this um, slide shows uh, pileateds have a maximum five mile uh, dispersal distance. And this is what this circle here shows. And I tried to show, I don't know if they show up in the TV, but there's some habitat sections out here. It has a 300 acre patch size requirement. And when we go out and do our analysis, the first thing prior to, do, to making any decision about how to use that piece of ground, we look at the linkages or, or, or the ability of breeding pairs to disperse out to other suitable habitats. And what this is showing is that it, um, currently we have a, a well distributed population, or at least well distributed to suitable habitat across our planting area uh, within that five mile dispersal capability. Okay, we come in here and, and uh, prior to 1986, our average fire size was 2,000 acres. And the particular area I'm looking at is logging gulch. If you took that average fire size for logging gulch over a 30 year period, um, that's shown here. What, what you see is that depending on, you don't know where the fire is going to occur, but depending on where the estimate it may occur, it, it would only take out like one or two of these patches and still maintain linkages to the rest of the, the planting area um, to suitable habitat. And so we feel like we would have maintained a high uh, likelihood of persistence over time given this scenario. But what has changed over time is that our fire size has increased dramatically. And again, using the same example, but yet the fire pattern that we've experienced over the last, um, last seven years, what you see is, is that where the fire pattern previously only affected maybe one or two patches, the current fire pattern that we have is influencing uh, a num quite a few uh, of the suitable habitat patches out there and actually threatening uh, 
our ability to maintain distribution and dispersal of breeding pairs across this particular landscape. Um, the Foothills Fire, which we had last summer, was uh, 256,000 acres. And uh, I don't know if anybody's seen that. This, we're in Oregon here, but that had virtually no mosaic. Um, very, very even pattern across the landscape. Very few islands of, of any kind of habitat other than, and pretty much reduced that whole area into an even age class uh, in the timber. And as a result, uh, not only eliminated habitat, eliminated habitat for the pileated woodpecker, but also for the flammulated owl and for uh, the white-headed woodpecker. Um, spe species that are tied to the open forest types as well as those tied to more climax uh, closed forest conditions. In addition, that fire, um, and again, I want to be careful here. I'm not trying to talk negatively about fire, but it had some very uh, severe ramifications to our watersheds. Because it was so extensive, far more extensive than what we think historically occurred, the level of sediment going into the streams was also far, um, far greater. And what we, what we saw was significant areas where we had dry gravel, landslides. That particular fire burned up so much of the watershed, there was actually certain portions where fish died in the stream because uh, the heat was um, so great, a firestorm condition where the fuels just uh, went up through the area and killed all the, in this case, a bull trout area. Uh, we had one area near Tipton Flat that had a firestorm. They estimated the winds at around uh, 80 to 100 miles an hour, and they lost 200 head of livestock, 60 elk, um, 30 deer. I had never seen that in a, in a fire that I'd been associated with. Traditionally, the wildlife was pretty much unscathed, maybe a few minor species that were tied to localized areas, but never where we had species that uh, died primarily prior to the flames from just heat moving through the um, stands and preheating pre conditions. So where do we go from here? If, I think what I've tried to present is that that we want to, on the Boise National Forest, we're trying to understand what the dynamics of the forest are in terms of uh, uh, how they have influenced successional stages and what that means in terms of wildlife. And we think that we've gone through a change from pre-settlement conditions in that we've increased our stand densities, we've increased the stand structures, and we've changed the disturbance patterns that influence the successional stages across the landscape. We think that that has an influences on wildlife habitat as as those events become greater and greater in size and more and more severe, we think that those have influences on our ability to manage for viable populations of mid and, and late cereal stage species, wildlife species. And the example I gave was a pileated woodpecker that as the stand size, as a, as a fire, stand replacement fire event increases in size, uh, the ability to maintain uh, breeding pairs across the landscape is in, uh, reduced. So well, the Boise has initiated a forest health strategy, and there's actually three parts, parts to it. Um, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit because I think they're important. The first part is salvaging dead and dying timber. And that's a short-term effect. It really has nothing to do with forest health. It doesn't change the stand characteristics. It doesn't reduce the um, tree densities. But it does recap recapture the loss of uh, uh, timber value, uh, values. And um, basically, we're going to the areas, identifying trees that were either influenced by fire or by insect and disease, and taking, and taking those areas and uh, eliminating the dead trees, taking out the dead trees, basically. Uh, on the Foothills Fire, we had 300, approximately 300 million board feet of salvageable timber, but we only harvested approximately 140. The remaining uh, volumes were left for shading purposes, for watershed purposes. Uh, we cross failed a lot of it to try to help the watershed. And also for, um, we're doing some studies on neotropical bird reestablishment in some of these areas, and so we're leaving some, some strips, uh, not, not actually strips, they're, they're quite large patches out there. And um, we're trying to analyze whether the, whether, uh, what the changes will be with a control area adjacent to uh, timbered, uh, non-burned areas. But we have harvested and aggressively harvested uh, 140 million board feet. We have a short-term window in which those values will stay approximately two years is all we have. And we should be done. The fire occurred in last summer. We should be done this December. Hmm. 
The other thing we're looking at is our stand densities, and this is the majority of the thing I talked about, looking at the characteristics we have in our, on our forest and how they've changed and how we can apply civil culture prescriptions um, to help reduce the risk of, of our stand replacement fires and try to bring ourselves back into a more, um, I don't want to use the word natural, but a, a back into the his, natural historic range of variability of our disturbance patterns. And by that I mean try to, to uh, bring it more into the less vulnerable to the severe stand replacement fires. And we're doing that through pre-commercial, through commercial thinning and extending the um, harvest rotations. Um, let me go back to that. And understory fire. The Boise National Forest will be looking at our stand characteristics and trying to reduce the stand densities to try to reduce the amount of competition for available water. And in addition, we'll be implementing um, underst understory uh, prescribed burning. And we're going from about 1,000 acres per year to about 10,000 acres per year is our, is our goal. Uh, we'll be learning a lot as we go along and trying to implement that and uh, hopefully gaining uh, public support as they'll have to live with some of the smoke that that'll produce. Um, but the other thing is that we're going to be looking at uh, um, the, uh, excuse me. One of the concerns is that we're going to apply this prescription uniformly across the landscape in, a, in an attempt to uh, to basically get timber volumes out, and that is not not the case. We recognize that there are certain uh, there was a certain patchwork or or uh, diversity across the landscape, uh, depending on what portion of the forest you look at, that was natural and um, in, and inherent in the landscape and. Uh, so we, we'll be looking at different prescriptions to meet other resource needs. Uh, on our forest, this, sh this sh slide kind of shows the breakdown of our forest, and about 25% of it is suitable for timber management. And of that 25%, we will probably only be intensively managing a, a, sm a smaller portion. We can't uh, apply that same prescription across that whole 25%. Um, it amounts to about 656,000 acres. Uh, we'll also be looking at pre-commercial thinning, and and um, and we're going to have to look at understory management and prescribed fire because it's only a short length of time. Uh, the fire frequency in, in our drier sites is every 10 years uh, pre-settlement. So if we go back to uh, we go in there and commercially thin and then leave it alone for 30, 40 years, we'll be back in the same situation we're in now. These so show some pictures on our, on our forest of some of the conditions we're trying to create. And uh, we hope that these stands are more resilient or more resistant to stand replacement fires. They don't have the laddering fuels, but also more resistant to epidemic uh, insects. We recognize the role that insects play in producing snags. And what we want to avoid is the epidemic role, epidemic uh, events, not, not the uh, uh, endemic events, I guess is the way we word it. And that, that concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, do you want to go to Great. questions now? Yeah, let's go to questions to LeGrand, and then we'll rotate around the remote sites. Anybody have any questions here? Gee, all, you all agree with that and everything I said? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you've, you've indicated there's a correlation between habitat and the, the wildlife species that occur in that habitat. If we were to go back to the historic forest landscape patterns mm -hmm. that we presume existed before the European people got here, mm -hmm. would the public like the wildlife mix? And is, is that, would that wildlife mix be acceptable with your current forest plan standards? Well, you're still going to have to mix in social values. And um, I, I don't know whether that mix will be, be acceptable or not. Um, I know that the consequences of not doing it, there are consequences of not doing it. And that's w one of the things I probably should have brought up in my talk is another thing we're looking at is what we call the no action alternative and trying to develop that fully. In the past, I think we threw out what we considered the no action alternative as if it was status quo, maintain the current conditions. And in fact, it's not. Um, it, it's a greatly uh, different scenario. And so what we're trying to go back to the public and say, OK, here's your options. We can do nothing. We can leave that, let that stand develop to a climax conditions. And in addition, the extent of those climate conditions will probably, probably uh, extend over large portions of our forest. 
and the consequences of that will, will be that we'll be in greater vulnerability to stand replacement fires over an extensive portion of our forest. Or we can go in there and, and apply some silvicultural prescriptions, try to uh, mimic some of the patchwork that we think existed out there in pre-settlement times to meet some of those mid and late serial stage species. And that's the way we're going to the public and asking them. And uh, that we do hear some concerns about that open uh, forest characteristics and its influence on elk vulnerability and how um, vulnerable are those uh, are elk to being shot. But there are other ways around that, including addressing access and that kind of thing. Um, I think what we found is that the, for the public does not like a 256,000 acre burn that eliminates it all to one age class. And uh, we've, we, we've heard that pretty clearly. So within that context, we're trying to manage for a variety of different values. And we'll have different prescriptions. We won't be able to duplicate uh, pre-settlement conditions. Did that answer your question? Did I? Yes, sir. OK. Other questions? Yeah. Push your button. No, you're it. Oh, oh, Jim, you're right. Good point. We should correct the director. Oh, okay. My my question is, uh, in your old growth areas on your national forests that uh, have had insect damage, how are you managing those, or are you? Um, we've set aside in our forest plan what we call dedicated old growth, a certain amount to assure that we. Uh, have maintained old growth species and to be real honest I think that was a, uh, uh, a, a mistake because it didn't recognize the dynamics of these stands. So, um, so we're going to have to look at that. Wh uh, where we had dedicated old growth we did not go in and alter the stand structure because of insects and disease. And the primary reason for that was that we didn't want to break the trust with the public that we would we would maintain those, the snags and the high, the down woody material and this kind of thing. Outside of those areas, what we did was we used the Region 4 old growth guidelines and looked at the number of snags per acre that would be maintained um, in, an, in, an, in a different certain habitat type and tried to assure that there was at least um, that many snags left after harvest of the dead trees. Um, of, of at least 20 inches deep, what we call uh, diameter at breast height. So, for example, in a uh, dug fir uh, nine bark habitat type, which we identify at climax would have approximately two plus snags per acre, we would leave at least three snags 20 inches or greater and then take, take the rest. Increased number of snags doesn't, um, we don't believe increasing this number of snags left out there will increase the length of period that the benefit of snags will, uh, will exist. It simply um, increases the number of, um, well, the number of snags out there. And there's a cer certain point at which um, there isn't a benefit to cavity nesting species. Other questions? Yes. In one of your last slides, uh, where I think you indicated a picture of something that you were trying to accomplish, it looked like an uneven age stand. Are you consciously trying to create uneven age stands? No, I don't think that under um, uh, the Forest Health Initiative we'll have uneven age stands at the stand level when you look at the at individual stands. But when you look at the landscape, I think you could see um, d uh, different stand ages ac across what we call the landscape. But it, I, I think if you go back and look at what we think occurred pre-settlement, you'll find that there wasn't a lot of diversity in age classes across that landscape. There was it was dominated by uh, mature and old, gro and old ponderosa pine. Again, I'm going to confine my comments to the dug fir habitat types and the drier sites because it's totally different when you go further north in our forest. But um, so, so that silvicultural prescription for forest health will be pretty much even age. Hmm. Yes? Have, have you made any estimates of how your shift to uh, very low density stands of slow growing cereal species will influence your total site productivity? And more specifically, will you then be able to meet your timber output goals? 
I, I didn't hear the, the what you said, the uh, site productivity. Is, it Is this mic working? It should be. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I was wondering how your, your emphasis is on um, very low density stands of cereal species, pine and larch, which are very slow growing. How will this influence your total site productivity? And how will this influence your uh, merchantable fiber production? Okay, I gotta um, preface my comments. I'm a biologist, not a forester. Um, so I'm, I may misstate this, but in the dug fir habitat types, um, a lot of these sites, um, I believe, are now experiencing a negative, negative um, um, grow, uh, site, site productivity. I, I guess that what I mean by that is more trees are dying than they are growing. And um, through commercial thinning, it'll actually turn it into a, to a positive where we'll have an increase in, in, in growth rates. I don't know what that'll mean to the ASQ. And we don't, we're analyzing it now for our forest plan. I, I guess my best guess would be that there would be an initial increase followed by a, a, a slight decrease. But, but I don't know that. I, we're, we're analyzing that. Let's go on to the remote sites. We're tuned in to Burns. Uh, do you folks have any questions for John? Yeah, I want to ask, uh, how are you going to pay for it? You talked about 10,000 acres of prescribed burn and pre-commercial thinning. That's a good question. And uh, initially, we can use KV funds on the timber sales for that, for site prep and for understory management. Um, in the long term, uh, that'll be that'll be difficult. It will it require more intensive management of the understory, and uh, we're we're trying to address that by looking at being more efficient with our burning program, and emphasizing the need uh, uh, for addressing forest health. Right now, there's a bill before Congress to look at a forest health and address some of these aspects, and we're hoping that it'll also have um, be able to address the funding needs for understory management. Um, we're not looking at uh, <coughs> wilderness areas to go in and do any kind of management uh, of this type in. Um, the primary area is 656,000 acres. And so um, the logical conclusion is the remaining uh, three-fourths of the forest will be subject to the same conditions that got us to this point. Um, and I think it'll be difficult enough in the next 10 years just to address those, those 656,000 acres. Thank you. Any other questions from Burns? Or from Ontario? Burns, excuse me. Here we go. Okay, we'll go on then to uh, Blue Mountain, Pendleton. No questions from Blue Mountain. No questions, all right, thank you. We'll go on to John Day. I'd like to follow up on Jim McGuire's question a little bit, a little bit more specifically. Uh, if we reduce the sand density like you're talking about, will that have any effect on deer and elk populations due to decreased cover to shoot and dissipate? And also, could you address um, whether you think that current populations of deer and elk are higher or the same or lower than uh, historic range of variability. Okay. Um, you know, our primary focus in this is looking at the non-game species uh, um, because, because they're the ones where we have a concern for maintaining the viable populations. And that's basically where my focus has been. In answering your question about deer and elk, from a biological standpoint, I don't think we're going to have, I think it's the, um, the stand replacement fires haven't been an adverse effect. Um, and going to a thin stand 
uh, more open stand will not have a, a adverse effect and possibly even a beneficial effect. But it's my opinion, and I want to emphasize that it's my opinion that that management of elk is primarily a social question rather than a biological question, and that is the size of the bull and the length of the harvest, uh, the hunting season, and that's where the um, elk vulnerability question comes in. There's no question that as you open up a stand, make it make sightability inside that stand easier, that, that it's easier to shoot the animal. And that has an effect, adverse effect, on the vulnerability. That, and if you open up our entire forest, you would have to do something else, such as close access or something, to maintain the same level of vulnerability that existed prior to harvest. And I, I'm sure that I'll generate some thoughts about what the relative importance is of elk and to the other species, but um, I view that as a social question and less of, uh, not a biological question. And social in that you're trying to address um, public demands for hunting, which, w which um, you still maintain the, the uh, viability of the elk, high elk numbers. On our forest, uh, even though roads have increased and timber harvest has increased and our fires have, have increased, the elk numbers have increased. And uh, I think that uh, the biggest concern that Idaho Fish and Game has is the ability to maintain their hunting seasons and still maintain the reputation of a five-point bull harvest, average harvest. Where do they fit into natural range of variability of the populations? I think they're well above. Does that answer your question? Maybe more detailed than you wanted. Any other questions from John Day? Okay, let's go on then to uh, Lane Community College and see who's there. Oh, he, did you have one? Oh, I had one more question. And did that last time, too. Okay, wow. nobody's at Lane. <laughs> All right. packed him in on that place. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure if we have anybody at Mount Hood or even if they're on this time. I think I can make a comment here. I also, I, I've told you two parts of our forest health strategy and I forgot the last part. Um, and the last part is to share the information, the assumptions and the things we're learning with the public, with groups like this and to try to gear, bring back feedback that we receive from them so that we can continue our learning process. Uh, we've uh, been working with the University of Idaho, with the American Foresters and with, uh, trying to work with the public in forums like this to bring back their comments, their concerns, and some of their thoughts, and and be challenged by some of the statements that we make, such so that that uh, we can be more responsive and, and let science be the the driving factor in in what we're trying to do. That was the third stage. I identified two. Okay, thanks, Tim. Okay, we're uh, over to Treasure Valley. Do you have any comments at Treasure Valley? Uh, well, I'm not sure where you're, where this is located. That's Ontario. Ontario. And you're putting out seed and not seedlings? Are you putting out seed? I'm just scattering the seed and scattering in my area. My experience has been with seeding like that is that you've made rodents real happy. And uh, we do not... Uh, uh, we did not broadcast seed bitter brush. We had the opportunity to do that with the Foothills Fire, and the public wanted us to do it, and I went up in front of them and said, no, we won't do it because broadcast seeding, unless you get the seed in the ground, uh, you have a very poor chance of success, and it gets gobbled up by rodents. Uh, sagebrush, uh, we had excellent success in reseeding sagebrush, but it's a species that ripe, the seed ripens in November, and and it's a wind-blown, wind-carried species and uh, is adapted to that kind of regen re uh, 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 regeneration into, into a burn site. But bitter brush is, you got to either plant it in the ground or s put it in the seedlings to have any kind of success. Okay, let's go to Wallawa, Wallawa Valley. But 
Oh, excuse me. Did you one, one comment. We have had good success by using seed dribblers on, on tracks of cats and working them in that way. Um, uh, that works out fairly well. Hmm. Willow Valley, any questions for John? where it is in our forest. Uh, the question I have uh, is if you use fire to control your by underburning, it appears to me that you burn up your large woody trees and go to open, you don't have enough traction. I have uh, four or five non uh, adjacent parcels I manage and they all have affiliated woodpeckers but they're in a lot thicker uh, stand than what you're showing there. Yeah. And I just wonder how you're going to avoid burning up their food. Well, it's certainly, I think also, I, let me answer that in two parts. Um, we can't go in there and burn without first going out and thinning out the stand and, and reducing the fuels because we'll simply have a stand replacement fire that'll take out the whole, um, whole tree structure. The second portion is, yeah, we're going to reduce the amount of uh, in some areas, the amount of pileated woodpecker habitat. Um, and I think that the point I was trying to m make, I probably didn't say specifically, is that we have some species in our forest that are well above, have benefited from uh, the trend towards more dense uh, tree species. But those same species are also very vulnerable right now to the kinds of events that we're having. And so what I think we're going to have to do is look at the, the um, Characteristic, vegetation characteristics across the landscape and use commercial thinning and understory burning to insul what I call insulate certain stands that we want to allow to go to climax for these species such as pileated woodpecker. Um, by insulated I mean that you'd actually designate certain areas where you would hope to make them less res uh, susceptible to stand replacement fires by, by making the surrounding area a fuel break. That I would expect I have more c questions. I'm not sure what the composition of this crowd would be, but, but I would think that that would be, um, I, th I think it makes biological sense, but I think it scares a lot of folks when they start thinking about managing intensively at that level. More questions from Wallawa? The other side of that also is as you open up those stands, you're also benefiting other species such as flammulated owls and um, white-headed woodpeckers. And we talked today about goshawks and the sustainability for those species. So there's uh, w another one of the problems that you saw with the Forest Service is that uh, in our documents we prepared in the past was that they tended to display the wildlife effects as being all negative to any kind of action alternative. And the reality is that uh, there are some negatives and there are some pluses depending on which, which group of species you want to look at. And there are some negatives and pluses to doing nothing to, to all the species. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go uh, to uh, Western Oregon at Monmouth and see if we had anybody come over there tonight. You folks have any questions of John? No, no questions. All right, thank you. We'll go back to John Day. I think we had one question there that we didn't answer. <coughs> Did do you folks have any more questions for John? No question. Okay, I thought I saw the gentleman there in the front. All right, uh, hearing no more questions there, do we have any more from LeGrand? Anything that came up? Go ahead. Yes, I had a, a quick question. When you're doing the understory burning, it fire is not specific to the seedlings. It burns all of them, including the ones that presumably you want, um, that are genetically adapted to that site over hundreds of years. Um, are you looking at, eventually those large trees are going to die. What kind of stand replacement are you looking at, and are you looking at, at replanting or just hoping that some will survive? Um. I should ask our next speaker about that because it's a silvicultural question. I'm a biologist, but, but you're right. It does take all the species, and you can't have it both ways. You can't have a thick stand of regeneration and have an open park-like stand of mature trees. 
and yet you do have to have um, recruitment. And I think that uh, we're going to be looking at, um, we're gonna, we have the capability now with a lot of our tools that, that we didn't have even three years ago to, to look at the stand distribution, stand characteristics across the land. I keep using the word landscape. I hope you know the large piece of ground out there. And, um, and addressing where we're going to have extended rotations where we would be looking at uh, managing that understory and reduce and suppressing um, uh, regeneration of dense stands uh, over a long period of time, 200 years possibly. Um, and in other areas, we probably will uh, go to higher densities, not, not severe densities we have right now, but higher density stands with the anticipation that in 80 years or so we'll, we'll harvest in there. And um, so I'm not trying to leave the impression that we're going to manage the whole area for a, a mature stand of ponderosa pine. Um, but we've got to know where and how we're going to do that. And certainly some seedlings have to, have to make it up. And I, I think if you look at the pattern of how those seedlings established and became old trees, they did it during those periods of wet years when um, your fire frequency extended out to, say, 20, 30 years. And, uh, and there was a few trees that were able to make it up to, a, to the height where they would um, have the resistant bark. And I think that's what was hap occurring. And I think that that same thing will occur with our management because we, we're not going to be able to be consistent every, for 250 years to go back every 10, 20 years. There'll be some things will lengthen out. Other questions? Yeah, so I was wondering if uh, mechanical methods have been considered to reduce the understory instead of prescribed burns. Yeah, I think we have the capability to do that, but you know, the Boise National Forest occurs on the Idaho Bathleth, which is a, an extremely erosive uh, piece of ground that's decomposed granite, and um, uh, I can, won't rule that out, but we'd have to do it in such a way as to not increase the sedimentation on the, in the area. Um, so I, you know, I think, there's, I think there's opportunities to do that, but um, we're going to have to be real careful how we apply it. Other questions? Any more questions from the remote sites? If anybody has any, we sure and uh, let us know. Tell us where you are. All right, hearing none, uh, let's uh, thank John for coming, and uh, he'll be leaving now.